Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium to present the inaugural Seymour Benzer Lecture, Dr. Amelia Eich. Thank you, Susan, and thank you all very much. Uh, before I officially start, I just want to say hello to the people in the overflow room. Hello. Um, I also want to um, move from this title slide to the reason that we're actually here. And that is for Dr. Seymour Benzer. So I find it extremely uh, humbling and to be here uh, as the first annual lecturer. And I also find it very difficult to summarize how much this man, who, who I've never met, has influenced what I do and what I'm about to tell you today. So in one slide, uh, I'm going to show you just a few words and some very important symbols. And these symbols are shown here at the bottom. These three symbols that I'm going to tell you about very briefly emphasize that this man, who is smiling and holding jars of flies, everybody see that? Um, he changed radically three separate fields of science. In physics, uh, I think some of you have heard of the transistor, right? Uh, Seymour Benzer was integral in the development of that. In molecular biology, a field that I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware of, he worked with an incredibly strange creature that is circled here. It looks like an alien. It's called a bacteriophage. And he coaxed secrets from this bacteriophage's uh, DNA and how it worked and basically formed the building blocks of what we know about molecular biology today. And I and every other molecular biologist uh, uh, rely heavily on his work. The last creature maybe you're more familiar with, especially if you've left bananas out on your counter for a while. This is a fruit fly. And Dr. Benzer used the fruit fly to generate not just incredibly important observations about how genes and behavior work, how they work together, but he developed the field of behavioral genetics. So again, my work looking at genes and behavior and in my personal uh, 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 lab, psychiatric illnesses, relies almost 100% on his work. So it's incredibly uh, um, uh, humbling for me. And I, I want to tell you one other thing about Dr. Benzer, which is even though he's no longer with us uh, in here, he is definitely with us even more than in, in spirit because his presence on the internet is extremely strong. If you type in Seymour Benzer, uh, you will get any number one of incredibly entertaining oral histories about him uh, from himself, uh, autobiographical, uh, biographical, from his colleagues, including uh, Dr. Brenner, who sponsored this, this lecture series. And uh, one in particular I just want to note is this one from the Howard Hughes Medical Investigator uh, in, uh, Institute that has a, a very interesting interview with him. Uh, if you're more of a, a reader, um, this is a wonderful book, uh, Overflow Room People. I hope you see this. It's called Time, Love, and Memory, A Great Biologist and His Quest for the Origins of Behavior. Uh, it was a National Book uh, Critics uh, Award. It's a fantastic book. It's about Dr. Benzer, but it's about so much more because he was about so much more than just him. He developed these fields. He changed what the way we think about science. And he did it in three fields, <laughs> not just one. So really remarkable. And he had such a uh, distinctive uh, voice that for me, um, when I look, when I read this book and when I look at the interviews online, I really felt like this little picture I'm showing you here. I felt like uh, there was a plane going through a large landscape, the complex landscape of science. And Dr. Benzer was driving the plane and I got to sit on top like a little brain and look where he was looking. I felt like I was on a trip with him. And I really encourage you, beyond what you hear me say today, I encourage you to go to your bookstore or to get online and take a trip with Dr. Benzer because it's, he's a man worth following around. So he is a distinctive voice and I am incredibly honored to be the first uh, Benzer lecturer. I find that uh, it, it also a, a bit striking because he was an expert in three fields and I am merely obsessed with one and that is this field, adult neurogenesis. Adult neurogenesis is depicted here in this human brain. 
This is a thoughtful looking person, uh, maybe thinking about these two areas deep inside the brain that in about 40 minutes you will each become an expert in. <laughs> these are areas of the brain that make new neurons in the adult. And I'll tell you why that's so surprising uh, in a few slides. But this adult neurogenesis is intriguing for many reasons. We think we might be able to harness these new neurons in the adult for regeneration. We think we might be able to harness them to learn about memory. Why is it that we learn and remember things? Or in my case, don't. <laughs> you might remember uh, from the introduction and notice here, I'm actually in a department of psychiatry. So one of my greatest interests, and what I'm going to be talking about more today, are the links of these new neurons to psychiatric disorders. I will only mention briefly some work done on related to depression and post-traumatic stress disorder, but I am going to spend quite a bit of time talking about our work on addiction, why we think these new neurons might be a useful target for thinking about how to treat addiction. So I also want you to notice, even though I'm in a department of psychiatry, I will not analyze you because I am a PhD, not an MD. And uh, therefore, this is the, uh, the sort of brain that I use. It's more, this is a, a, a large human brain trying to get into a mouse hole. I do not work with humans. I work with rats, and I work with mice. And some of you might already say, well, why am I here? Get my ticket, I'm going out. Well, this is why. Not only are you looking at what I find one of the coolest pictures ever, um, but you're looking at new neurons in a mouse brain. These hot pink cells, in fact, these hot pink cells I'm so obsessed with that I always try to wear hot pink, and I don't know if you can see it on my, my cuffs here. Um, these hot pink cells are immature neurons. They're teenage neurons deep inside the, the mouse brain. Do you notice this sideways V? You see that sideways V? That's incredibly characteristic, and that's going to help us on our trip today. Because in the human brain, so this is the mouse brain in the background, in the human brain, cut here in this orientation, you can see this sideways V, okay? And you can actually stain these cells in the human brain. So the mouse brain is an excellent model for looking at neurogenesis, and it tells us things that might inform human work. Now, this mouse, this mouse work that we do, um, another reason I want to uh, point out or defend our use of mouse to think about the human is Dr. Benzer and actually um, uh, Dr. Miller, who's here today, his widow, actually published some really interesting and pivotal work showing that antibodies from the fly or proteins from the fly actually can be used to label the human brain. So they're all really connected. And even though a fly is not a human and a mouse is not a human, we really can make some significant advances. And I'm looking forward to making some of these advances with you today, because you're going to become an expert. And because you're going to go on a trip with me. Now, the trip with me that we're going to go on, you're going to, uh, this airplane here, and this is you, a little brain on top of the airplane, we're going to go to about 30,000 feet for most of the lecture. And the reason is because we have a lot of ground to cover. I want to tell you about what these new neurons in the brain, these hot pink cells, what they can do for you. That's a huge area to cover. But from 30,000 feet, we can go pretty fast. We can cover a lot of ground. We also are going to discuss very briefly some how these new cells might help with regeneration, memory, mood. And I'm going to talk to you about some of my lab's work specifically on addiction. I'm then going to spend a portion of the time at the end of the talk talking about what you can do for these new neurons. If they're really good, how do I keep them? How do I get more of them? Now, as we take this trip together, um, I think it would be helpful if you had a flight plan. So I, I'd like to give you a couple of things to look for. Uh, Number one, you're going to see a lot of landmarks. And the number one landmark that you're going to see about five times during this lecture are these hot pink cells. Okay, so, so look for that. And about the fifth topic that we bring it up, you'll know we're pulling back to the gate. Okay. Another landmark that you're going to see on this is uh, any good flight has movies, right? So we have movies during this flight, which is great. No food, sorry, no food. But there, is, uh, there are movies. And you will see, for example, a movie that you would not see on a normal airplane, which you'll see a movie of rats taking cocaine, which we'll, I think you'll be looking forward to, right? Um, another thing that you're gonna, that's a, uh, a, about the flight plan of this talk 
is while we will be up at 30,000 feet for most of the talk, because I really want to make sure I get some of the take home messages across to you, because I want you to come on a flight with me of what it's like to be so obsessed with new neurons, we are at some points going to go down to a much lower altitude. I'm going to show you actual data from our lab two times, okay, which actual graphs and actual numbers, but don't worry. I'm always going to pull back up and tell you what the take home message is and give you that broad view. So please stick with me on the highs and on the lows so that we can get everybody engaged in this. And I'm hoping to do this in a short enough period of time that while you, after you hear my distinctive voice, I will then get to the really exciting part of the evening, which is hearing your distinguished questions. So keep thinking of those questions, and we'll have a really nice time to, to talk about them at, at the end of this. All right, so I need you to buckle up. I need you to put your tray in the upright position. Uh, I'd like to inform you that there are two exits in the back and two exits here. Um, and uh, let's pull away from the gate. To think about the big picture, it helps to think about a big number. 100 billion is a big number. And we're on this flight together, and you almost could think that it's a, a nighttime flight because there are actually 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. You might think I'm going to be talking about astronomy. But actually, I'm not going to be talking about the stars in the Milky Way. The 100 billion number is the number of neurons that, on average, a human is born with at birth, an infant. Now, these neurons, okay, shown here in yellow and down here, are sort of the rock stars of the central nervous system. They are the thing that carry the signaling that we've known for many years. They've named a whole field after it, neuroscience, which is uh, one I'm pleased to be. But interestingly, there are many, many more of other types of cells, like this cell, an astrocyte. There are 100 billion to trillions of astrocytes. You don't hear much about astrocytes. You don't hear about astrocyte science although maybe we should. In a couple years, I think you will. But how do we get here? How do we get to a brain having neurons and astrocytes and all these other types of cells? Well, we get there by the process of neurogenesis. And neurogenesis roughly consists of a neural stem cell. This is a, a cell that can give rise to many different types of cells. It gives rise to a progenitor. It's a good way of thinking about a progenitor is something that's rapidly dividing. And this dividing cell then makes a choice and goes on to become a neuron or maybe an astrocyte. Now, when I was at UC Irvine, just up the road, are there any anteaters in the audience? Yeah, OK, yeah. Um, zot. Uh, when I was at UC Irvine, I got an excellent PhD uh, training in uh, neuroscience, or as they called it back then, psychobiology. And I learned that something that I believed for a long time, that you are born with a certain number of neurons, and if you are stressed, or if you age, or if you're sleep deprived, all things that occurred to me in graduate school, um, <laughs> or if you take addictive drugs, my parents are here, so no, that didn't occur to me in graduate school, um, all of those things might kill your neurons. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a little depressing, right? Uh, I'd like to keep my neurons, right? I mean, why would I want to kill them off? But it's even more striking, this idea of killing neurons, if you think about many neurodegenerative disorders, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, stroke, spinal cord injury, you know, all of these, if we could figure out a way to get our own brain to repair itself, that would you know, be remarkable. And I, I had always hoped that there might be some way of harnessing the cells that we make when we're babies and that we keep them, and we utilize them to prevent, repair, or regenerate the injured brain. I hoped, but there was someone else who did a lot more than hope. And this someone else is the father of modern neuroscience. Um, he looks a little serious, doesn't he? Uh, his name is Santiago Ramon y Cajal, and he is uh, revered in the field of neuroscience for what he did. And what he did was look at a lot of slides with a lot of different brains on it. And when he was alone in a room with the slides, what he did was what a best, the best scientists do, which is including what Dr. Benzer did. He observed. And even better, he drew. He drew some of the most remarkable pictures. This is a picture that he drew of cells in the cerebral cortex, Latin for bark, that's on the outside of your brain. And this work of his uh, was so famous that actually, I don't know if you can see these signatures here. This was signed by the astronauts. Um, 
on the Space Shuttle Columbia, and this drawing, the original drawing, actually went up in the Space Shuttle Columbia as a tribute to Cajal. He also drew this other structure called the hippocampus, and I think you're going to recognize this, right? Look at this sideways V here. See that? That's the sideways V in those hot pink cells that you saw on the very first slide. So he drew a lot of these cells, and he looked, and he looked, and he said, do I see new neurons in the adult brain? And he was so uh, thorough and so smart and won the Nobel Prize. So when he said this quote, everyone believed him. After early development, everything may die, nothing may be regenerated. Maybe that's why he looks so sad. <laughs> so this idea of hope for prevention, repair, and regeneration, at least from Cajal's time with the techniques that he had, it, it didn't look very promising. You're born with a number of new neurons, and they're going to die if you're stressed, aged, or go to graduate school. OK, but fortunately, there are new techniques that actually give rise, that we found gave rise to new answers. What you're looking at here are some classical drawings of the hippocampus. Everybody sees that? You're going to be going like this, like a little gang sign when you leave here. And look here, here's Cajal's sign. Now later, with the advent of molecular biology, many of uh, advances that were developed by Dr. Benzer, we actually now can look at the hippocampus in a different way. Here's the sideways V, and here's the sideways V. And these are modern approaches using viruses and transgenic mice to actually label these new cells. So looking at the hippocampus throughout the ages, we also discovered this. These monoclonal antibodies that label for these immature hot pink neurons. And the term here that we use for this antibody is double quartan cells. These are the teenagers, the whippersnappers, if you will. Not only can we label the teenagers, we can also label the dividing cells. Remember these cells, the progenitors, the ones that actively divide? You might recognize this as a simplified version of the cell cycle, where a cell divides its DNA. If you give a mitotic marker to an animal, you can actually label a cell when it's dividing. And you can label it relatively permanently, so that when that cell grows up, about, let's say, four weeks later, you can actually see that it becomes a neuron. So now comes our first of four movies of the talk. And uh, you're going to see a mature neuron actually in the granule cell layer. And I'll show it twice, so don't worry if you don't see it all the first time. You're looking at green cells here. These are cells that were labeled with this mitotic marker BRDU four weeks earlier, just by giving the animal an injection in its belly. And it's also labeled with these red. Red means neuron. And blue, blue means astrocyte, or those glial cells. So that is an example of how we can actually watch these cells go on to become new neurons. Pretty exciting. But as you watch it through the second time, look at it with me here. These green cells over here, some of them are actually labeled with red. They went on to become neurons. But look at this cell. I don't know if you can tell, but it is hugged all the way around by blue. Do you see that? It's getting a blue hug. Yeah. I get hugs when I'm blue. Um, so that is an example not of a cell going on to become a neuron, but a cell going on to become an astrocyte. Okay, so what I'm emphasizing here is not only can you give rise to new neurons throughout life, it looks like you can actually give rise to new astrocytes throughout life. And this, this actually is another reason why I think in a couple years, not only will we have neuroscience, but we'll have astroscience. That doesn't quite sound right. I'll work on the name. I'll get back to you. Okay, but using all those new tools, the new ways of thinking about this, we decided as a field that Cajal, for many of the things that he was right about, this one thing, the techniques were holding him back. Using all those techniques, we now know this, a much more positive statement. The adult mammalian brain can give rise to new cells with neurogenic potential. Fancy way of saying the rat, the primate, and the humans, us. We make new neurons throughout life. And this development of using these markers like BRDU and double quartan to look at these new neurons led to an immense uh, excitement and almost a sigh of relief in the field. Um, this is one classical headline from Nature Medicine, take comfort in human neurogenesis. Maybe we have it in our own brains that we could repair our own injuries, that we could prevent uh, some of the cognitive damage that occurs with aging. That, as my particular interest is, that we could help psychiatric disorders. Extremely exciting. But, and here's the big uh, obstacle on the horizon as we're really cooking now in our flight is to harness the regenerative power of, of new neurons. We have to understand them. How do they work? What do they do? Um, what happens to them after a while? Uh, so 
these key questions and the answers I'm going to give you in the remainder of our talk, um, I've put into two main topics. One, you know, two that you already know. One is, what are these neurons good for? And that's what we're going to spend probably the next 20 minutes on. What are they actually good for? Then, about the last 10 minutes, we're going to talk about, well, what's good for them? What can I do back for them? So let's go on our little bit of a flight here. We're going to now zoom way high up, and there will be a few times, again, where we dip down to those low altitudes. So please make sure your seatbelts remain fastened until I turn on the questions now slide. When we get to this section about what is good for them, I think of this, this is a paper airplane with a brain on it. I think of this as the more targeted approach. You know, now that we know what they're good for, what's really, what's, what's good for them? How can I make these neurons better? So, but we're up here at uh, 30,000 feet now. What are they good for? Well, one thing I think we all hope that they are good for is regenerative medicine. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could harness for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, spinal cord injury, stroke, um, and I'll even put on here uh, one of the more um, uh, heart-rendering uh, uh, illnesses, uh, brain cancer. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could use new neurons and stem cells? Well, those of you that are interested in learning more about this, um, it's still a very, very uh, nascent field. I encourage you to go to this website, www.clinicaltrials.gov, and I want you to type in these terms, neural, stem, cell, and brain. And if you do that, you'll see that there are over 120 trials that are actually recruiting to try to see if we can harness stem cells to repair and fix the injured and diseased brain. I have to tell you that most of these are for cancer, um, and I think that's, that's wonderful. We're making a lot of advances in cancer. There are one or two for neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's disease, but I encourage you to look at it to learn more about it. But right now, what we can say is there is a lot of hope and there's a lot of action on this website. It's very exciting. One other thing you need to know about these cells, though, is in a case like this, where they're getting the cells from is not from within your own brain. It's cells that they're going to grow in a dish and then put into your brain. Now, that's useful because you can grow lots of them. You can tell the specific cells what to do. But they're exogenous outside the body. And I hold out hope that we could actually look inside the brain and take our own cells and harness them and tell them where to go and how to fix certain things. So, but if you want to know where they are, you have to take a little bit of an anatomy lesson, okay? So everybody's ready for a little anatomy lesson. I got some nods, that's good. So you already know this. You already know there's two regions. There's this region here in the front and there's this region that looks weirdly like a shrimp. So this is the human. I'm now going to move to this mouse brain which I've told you is extremely exciting and helpful for science. This mouse brain is faced this direction, and um, the brain is sectioned this way. So the olfactory bulb is on this side of the screen, olfactory bulb. And in fact, that is one of the key areas where new neurons are born, in the olfactory bulb. And I want, I'm not going to actually talk too much about the olfactory bulb, but I do want to give you a great mnemonic to remember that new neurons are born there. The way that you remember it is there's a structure called the rostral migratory stream, this RMS, where these cells literally migrate forward. And you can see that a little bit better here, this RMS, they migrate forward. And where are they migrating to? The olfactory bulb. So how do you remember that? Well, instead of calling it the rostral migratory stream, the nostril migratory stream. <laughs> now, this is anatomically a little incorrect. It's not going to your nostril, but you'll remember it now, won't you? Yes, you will. Okay, so that's one area. The area that we're going to talk for the most of, of this flight about is this area, the hippocampus. You remember this already. You're all experts, right? There's your sideways V. Here's your hippocampus. And the hippocampus in the mouse, you remember, has these hot pink cells, right? There are many different stages of neurogenesis tucked into this, these cells here. And this is a schematic I'm going to rely on for quite a few of my talks, my, quite a few of my uh, slides. So I want you to remember that. Now, these two areas of the brain, the olfactory bulb and the hippocampus, they make new neurons. Pretty interesting. Um, one thing you might ask is, well, are they really useful? Yes. They wire correctly and they fire correctly. These aren't just aberrant cells that are sitting there. They actually join the circuitry, which is pretty exciting. But then you might ask, hey, go back to the big picture again, Amelia. What are they good for? Well, you're going to get a clue if you think about what these structures do. 
Both of these brain regions are linked to learning and memory. The hippocampus is linked to spatial memory and to mood. So spatial memory, finding your way here today, okay, if you weren't using a Garmin, um, uh, finding your way here today was using your hippocampus. In the olfactory bulb, olfactory memory uh, definitely is also linked to these new neurons, uh, that, that has a memory component, the olfactory bulb. So what are new neurons good for? They're good for, we hope, regenerative medicine. We also think they might be important for learning and memory. And I'm going to zoom through this part because we're, I want to get to the next movie really quickly. How do we know that they're good in learning and memory? Well, scientists do something that most people do in life. They correlate. They say, let's see if new neurons correlate with something. But what do they correlate with? Well, I'd ask you, because you guys actually know the answer. If I asked you this question, how do you see and measure neurogenesis? You're already pros at this. You know that we can look at this sideways V of the hippocampus. We can look at these different stages of neurogenesis, which I'm showing you slightly differently, but same concept of stem cells, dividing cells, and immature neurons. And you know that we can use BRDU, remember this birth dating, to label dividing cells. And we can use double quartin to label these hot pink cells. Remember the hot pink? So that's how you see these. Well, what about, uh, oh, and that's beautiful. I love that picture. Um, but how do you visualize the source of them? How do you visualize stem cells? I haven't told you anything about that yet. And I need to, because Dr. Benzer, his work was critical in my lab and many others developing ways to see these stem cells. So let me just show you this. How you visualize stem cells. There's a three-step process to doing this. Number one, you hope that Dr. Seymour Benzer has figured out the basics of molecular biology. That's the first step. Once he has done that, you can hire two awesome postdocs, who I'm showing you here, who recognize that this uh, gene nestin is expressed in stem cells, and then they go on to do molecular biology magic using the principles that Dr. Benzer developed. And for those molecular biology people in the audience, here's a schematic of how we did this. For those of you that are not, here's the take-home message. We made genetically modified mice using Nestin, and we made them inducible. They have an on-off switch. If we do nothing to the animals, they look totally normal, and their brains look totally normal. If we give a compound to them, the stem cells fluoresce green. And that's what you're looking at here. Here's one sideways V, here's another sideways V, right? You guys get that sideways V now, right? So that's how Dr. Benzer's work, because he did all this molecular biology, the, the fundamentals, we were able to now identify stem cells in this mouse brain. So great, 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 great. You can visualize these different stages of neurogenesis. Come back to the big picture again. What are they good for? Give me some correlative data. Show me a movie. How about I give you the take home message first? Because it's a pretty easy one. Good things increase neurogenesis, and bad things tend to decrease neurogenesis. So one good thing is using your brain. You used your brain to get here if you did not use a Garmin. This mouse is using his brain to find a hidden platform. This is a, a black mouse swimming in a pool that's filled with opaque white substance. So it cannot, but I think you can, see there's a hidden, you see a shadow there? There's a hidden platform that's submerged. This mouse is using cues on the wall to find that hidden platform, spatial memory. This is called the Morris water maze. It's a test of spatial memory. And this is a test of whether you think mice are cute. Oh, isn't that cute? Thanks to Craig Powell for that movie. So good things in, uh, increase neurogenesis, bad things decrease neuro neurogenesis. This animal, when it uses its brain to find that platform, it has more new neurons. So maybe you should put away that Garmin, something to think about. OK, so we've got good things increase neurogenesis, bad things decrease neurogenesis. I think you're going to follow me on this next one. Yes, but that's correlation, right? That doesn't really mean that new neurons are that important. So what scientists did is they figured out a way to knock out new neurons and see if that had a difference. And the way that they figured out to knock it out, one way is to irradiate the brain here elegantly demonstrated by a lightning bolt. So that lightning bolt kills the cells that are, are dividing. So you kill the cells that are dividing. Can this animal find that platform? Does it remember where the platform is? 
If I put it in the pool, will it have trouble? And the answer is very, very clear in some, some studies that yes, that mouse now has a difficult time remembering where that platform is. But if you look at the whole literature, because we're going down a little close here, I gotta tell you a secret of the field. If you look at the literature, the real answer is only sometimes. And the reason it's sometimes, you, I think, can appreciate. Here's why. When you knock out just dividing cells, you still have stem cells left. Maybe after a while, if you wait too long after irradiating, maybe the neurogenesis comes back. And that's why the animal doesn't have a memory deficit. So what I'm telling you here is that this, irradiation, it's a wonderful place to start to ask causative questions. It's a really bad place to finish. So to ask this more causative question about whether new neurons are actually important, we use, and many others use, their own uh, uh, inducible transgenic mice. In fact, many other labs, about 60 labs in the world, have our mouse now and are asking these sort of questions. Because we can't just inducibly make these cells uh, glow. I can also inducibly kill those stem cells. And in doing that, then can ask the question, what are new neurons good for? Are they actually good for learning and memory? Now, from all these studies, one thing that has come out of it that gives me personally some tingles is this concept, that this is fundamentally a new form of plasticity in the brain. We used to think that cells in the brain maybe changed the way they connected to each other or the types of chemicals they sent to each other. We're talking about a fundamentally different type of plasticity, adding new cells. That's really amazing. There's some very interesting, actually, work that suggests subtracting cells also can be good for memory. Food for thought and for questions later. So we're more than halfway through this part. Um, I want to now mention this, the psychiatric disorders. So what are they good for? I'm not saying that new neurons are good for psychiatric disorders. I'm saying it looks like they might be good for the treatment of psychiatric disorders. And how we got there, we started with this. We looked at what makes new neurons go up and what makes them go down. Some of these things you already know. Uh, and when you look at this list, I think you'll see that there are some links with psychiatric disorders. For example, things that make the number of new neurons go down, set, stress, age, drugs of abuse. And one of the drugs of abuse that my lab has used quite a bit is uh, morphine or heroin. And when I say use quite a bit, I mean give to animals, not use ourselves. Um, on the other hand, things that increase neurogenesis, enriched environments like living in Dallas, Texas, um, voluntary exercise, using your hippocampus, right? You know that one, remember that mouse swimming. Interestingly, antidepressants also increase new neurons. That's shown here by this, and I'd be happy to talk about that more. That's some work I did in collaboration with Jessica Malberg and Ron Duman when I was a postdoc. Yes, but, Amelia, here's the next one. From this high altitude view, is that correlation or is that causation? For example, if I make an animal have more new neurons, will it be less depressed? If I make an animal have less neurons, will it actually be more likely to get or stay addicted? And that's the data that I want to show you really quickly. But I need to make you care quickly about the cycle of addiction. Because this cycle of addiction is something that you see in humans and you also see in animals. Now, in animals, it's really hard in general to look at psychiatric disorders, right? Um, I can't, for example, put a mouse on a couch uh, and, and, and ask them, you know, how are you feeling today? Or in case there are any Freudians in the audience, tell me about your mother. <laughs> but what I can do, especially when it comes to addiction, is I can look for an addiction-like phenotype. Does this animal look like it's addicted? And the model that we use is something that you're going to see uh, a, a movie of in two slides, and that's the rats taking cocaine. But this cycle of addiction you need to, to look at and think about first, because you need this background to appreciate the movie of the rat taking cocaine. This is an incredibly devastating cycle, where initial exposure to a drug of abuse leads in humans and in animals to acquisition or compulsive, eventually compulsive use of taking the drug. And there's a very interesting literature on the transition from just taking a drug casually to really being addicted and making compulsive use. Because of negative effects, or th this might lead to abstinence in a human, 
but because of drug cues or stress, maybe this leads to craving, which then leads to relapse, which leads to this cycle. It's a devastating cycle. It hits all countries, all societies, all socioeconomic status, and there are no excellent treatments. There are some good treatments, but no excellent treatments for it. So animal models are a really great way of thinking about addiction. This is a rat who's about to take cocaine. And I'm going to start the movie, and I'm going to talk you through what it means in regards to, there it goes. I'm going to talk you through what this means in regards to the cycle of addiction. So you're looking at a rat that has a jugular catheter implanted. It goes underneath its skin. We do this under aseptic conditions. It goes into its jugular vein. And every time this rat presses this lever over here, there is a syringe pump outside of the box that delivers cocaine. So this is self-administered cocaine. This animal is choosing to take this drug. And while I take animal work incredibly seriously, uh, I would like to say that I think this is an, the best model of a psychiatric disorder that we have. It is not addiction. It's not human addiction. But this animal only presses this lever. It will never go to this other level over here. This less lever is the one that delivers the cocaine, and the right lever does nothing. And we can also, also ask the animal another question. We can ask, how hard will you actually work for the drug? So let's look at this movie together, and this is the last movie uh, of the talk. This is an animal that's taking, you see this letter there? It said FR1. That means it presses a lever one time, and it gets one IV injection of cocaine. We can then up the ante, ask the animal to press it twice, as it is right here, FR2, for one injection of cocaine. And then we can ask it to press it four times, and then six times, and up and up. And given the right conditions, this animal will press this lever and do nothing else. In many studies, animals will choose this, pressing the lever over uh, food, over water, over sex. Um, females will choose it over nursing, uh, the option to nurse pups, which they find really rewarding. So I take this work very seriously. I understand the concerns with, with animal research. But we have no good treatments for addiction. And this is an incredibly powerful way to ask what happens in the brains of these animals and what might we do to these animals to get them off the drugs that then we could translate into the clinic. All right, so we've got this cycle of addiction. We have a wonderful animal model, and we have wonderful graduate students. Michelle Noonan and Sarah meet the audience. The audience meet Michelle and Sarah. They looked at the literature, and they said, most drugs of abuse decrease and make abnormal neurogenesis. And they said, yeah, but is that correlation or is that causation? Let's actually go in and do this. Let's irradiate the brains of these rats, just the brains, to knock out the new neurons, and let's see if it changes their addiction. That way we can tell, are these new neurons, is this correlative change or is it actually causative? Is that decrease of new neurons actually bad or good for addiction? So they asked this question, does adult-generated hippocampal neurons play a role in the addictive process? And these are some of the only graphs of data I'm actually going to show you in the last 10 minutes or so of the talk. And here's the take-home message. And I'll give you an even bigger take-home message in a second if you want to you know, close your eyes for a second. Um, decreased adult neurogenesis leads to increased vulnerability in an animal model of, of addiction. Here's the data that support that. If I ask, will you rat who has been irradiated, will you press a lever, uh, learn to press a lever for cocaine? Not only will they learn to press, yes, this shows the number of days that they administer the drug. This is the number of cocaine reinforcements that they get. Not only will they take more, but they're more sensitive. They have a higher bar, so they take more cocaine. In addition, how hard will you work for the drug if you have less? If you have fewer neurons, you will work harder. Here, this shows different doses of cocaine and the ratio completed. How many of those FR schedules will they go up to? And at this highest dose, they have significantly more. What's most fascinating about this is this. Not only will these animals take more, not only will they work harder, but it only works for a drug. It doesn't work for a food or another rewarding substance like sugar. And that's really interesting to scientists because we used to think that food and drugs of abuse work on the same pathways. 
All right, so the take home message for those of you that would just like a, a, a version of this is we think that if you have less neurogenesis, you might be more vulnerable to addiction. You might be more, get more addicted. You also might have less flexibility, um, and that could play a big role in relapse. Uh, so we're thinking about now how to address these studies in a more clinical way. We're working with several groups to look at clinical uh, uh, human cocaine addicts and looking at new neurons in their brains. And I'm really excited about potentially making an impact in a, uh, a disease that is so devastating and so difficult to treat. So we have finished 80% of the talk. The next part goes very quickly. In fact, I can see the airport from here. But I want to tell you what you've learned so far. You've learned so far what these new neurons are good for. There's a lot of hope for regenerative medicine. There's some very good correlative and some causative evidence that they're good for learning and memory. We also have some causative evidence that if you have fewer new neurons, you're more likely to get addicted. And we're now using our fancy mouse, our inducible transgenic, to ask these questions. Because again, irradiation, wonderful place to start, bad place to finish because it causes so many other side effects. I won't be able to tell you today, but I want to just give you a hint that we have done similar work with correlation and causation, looking at animal models of post-traumatic stress disorder, looking at the efficacy of antidepressants, and other groups have done some really remarkable work, even with our mice, uh, looking at neurologic disorders, for example, looking at whether these new neurons might be good uh, for repair after stroke. So we've flown an awful long distance together. I, I feel like we know each other. I feel like you know the hippocampus really well. And I feel like you know what these new neurons are good for. Regenerative medicine, understanding learning and memory, and some psychiatric and neurological disorders, some hope for those. Well, what's good for them? Let's take this targeted approach together in the last eight minutes. You know, one thing that is good for these new neurons in both regions of the brain is stimulation. And one of the most potent stimulators of new neurons, many of you don't want to hear this, is exercise. Okay, and what I'm showing you here is uh, here's a mouse on a treadmill, okay, looking a little angry, and here's a couch potato mouse. So who do you think might have more new neurons, right? The one on the treadmill. Although, who knows about anger? Anger is stress. Stress might decrease it. Now, let's say, I have good news though, let's say you are not uh, a treadmill mouse or a treadmill human. Here's another way to stimulate your brain. Use it, right? Find, turn off the Garmin, use your spatial memory, or attend the distinctive voices, okay? Because in doing that, you're actually making your brain stronger. And there's no downfall to it, okay? Except maybe you, 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 you miss some of your TV shows tonight. So what's good for them? Stimulation. So good for you for coming here. You also need a couple other things. You need the right place. These new neurons need the right place. This first one, you can really control. You can control whether you stimulate your brain or not. It's a little trickier for you to control the environment or the niche for these stem cells as they go through these maturations. But running and stimulation will change the niche for them. You might get more blood vessels. You might get more uh, good things called growth factors in there. Here's another thing that's tricky for you to control the genes and the epigenome, which is everything but the genes. If you have the right genes and the right epigenome at the right time, you actually can also drive new neurons or block new neurons. And this is work that is actually being done from an incredibly ground-based level. I'm talking not, not 30,000 feet, not 10,000. I'd have to take you way down into the trenches, and I'm going to do it just for one slide. One way that we're doing this to figure out what are the genes that are good for neurogenesis is using our fancy mouse again, our inducible nest in mouse, we've actually dissected, we and many other groups have dissected these different stages of neurogenesis and different molecules, different genes that are important for moving from one stage to another. And that's really exciting because many of these molecules are good drug targets. Um, there are wonderful uh, postdoc and a great graduate student in my group that have discovered some of these genes. And just this morning, I have to say this because my parents are here and I have to tell them the good news. Just this morning, we got another paper accepted to Nature Medicine, very excited, um, on another compound called FMRP. Some of you might have heard of it because it's Fragile X Mental Retardation uh, Protein. So this Fragile X protein is really important for new neurons. It's a, and it's a molecule, and it's something we could genetically target. And that's so exciting to me. And it might be less exciting to you because it's too close to the ground. So pull me back up, Amelia. Give me a little perspective. Let me give you this. 
if we can harness this molecular and genetic control, we can harness neurogenesis. Okay? So yeah, it, it's really useful. If we can do this really geeky work, we can then help, help, help mice and then help humans. So stimulation is good, right environment is good, right genes, right epigenome. Th that, that's, that's mostly it, except for one thing. I have to tell you that I might leave you with the wrong impression, that maybe you're thinking, I want a drug, and I want a drug that I can put in a needle and inject them into my brain, and I want more new neurons. Give me more, okay. Well, I, have I got the drug for you? There are many groups that are working to identify compounds to increase neurogenesis, specifically, not in a generic way to make the animals have seizures or, or make them run around more, but specifically to target those new neurons. So I want to share with you some unpublished data from my lab about these fabulous cells, this fabulous postdoc, David Petrick, and this amazing compound, Asoxazole 9. This compound, when we give it to mice, a normal mouse, these double cortin cells, right? You, this is, you, these are like your old friends now, aren't they, right? It's your old friends. These look like this. But if we give an animal isoxazole, look at how much bigger its dendritic tree is. And that dendritic tree, that's its listening. Those are its ears. It's almost like its brain. So isoxazole, great. More branches. Wait a minute, Amelia. Who says more new branches makes you smarter? Well, David Petrick does. When he puts these animals in the water maze, which you've seen, he sees no difference in learning, okay? They learn the same, which means they swim the same. But this small increase over this one, this is a huge difference to a behavioral scientist. If you're a behaviorist, you know that this increase in memory of remembering where that platform is, is awesome. So this compound actually makes more, uh, more new neurons makes them have bigger, uh, bigger dendritic trees, and makes them remember more. But, this is the last time I'll say it, is it correlation or is it causation? Well, excitingly, I can tell you that we have used our inducible mouse to actually ask this question, and we're pretty sure that we're able to show causation. There's one gene that we've been looking at that we think is controlling this. So we've got the drug, we know how the drug works, we think, and we're excited to move forward and publish this work. But don't tell anybody, because it's unpublished. We're at the gate. The jetway is pulling up. I have left you with a lot of things to think about, and I've told you that we don't just want a compound, okay? We want a compound that gives us more new neurons in the right place, making the right connections, and having the right function. So remember that. It's not just more. They gotta be the right more. I hope I've left you with some questions for me and some answers for this. I hope you had a good flight with me, okay? Um, I hope you got some ideas for some targeted approach of how you can make uh, these more new neurons happier. And I hope you understand that we want to harness these cells. We want to understand them. Uh, I think you'll remember the landmarks, right? You won't forget me and my hot pink cuffs. Uh, you won't forget the movies of the rats taking cocaine. Uh, I hope you hung on for the high altitude and the low altitude. And I hope you understand that if we can understand stem cells, and if we can understand neurogenesis, I think we can understand the brain, um, its function, and then we can help repair the injured and the diseased brain. As I take your questions, which I hope there, there will be, I'm gonna leave you with the smiling faces of all the people I've been lucky to work with currently and in the past, um, my fantastic collaborators at UT Southwestern and elsewhere, the funding that I've been so, uh, 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 pleased uh, to, to receive um, Dr. Brenner and the Benzer Lecture Committee and the National Academy for, for allowing me to, to give this lecture, my mentors at UC Irvine and at Mount Sinai. I'd also like to thank my husband, who couldn't be here, um, and uh, my parents for providing the genetic material that allowed me to give the talk today. <laughs> and I'd like to thank you for your attention and for your uh, distinguished questions. Thank you very much.